Okay, so in the previous video, uh, we uh, stated the Bolzano Weierstrass theorem, and now what we're going to do is begin the proof of it. Uh, but before we can prove it, there is a few preliminary things that we need to make sure are clear, uh, which we're going to use in the proof of the Bolzano Weierstrass theorem. So the first one is, oh dear, not that. Uh, the first one is that. Um, that if you've got a monotonically decreasing sequence of real numbers, that providing that is bounded, uh, it will converge. So this is a very basic theorem in real analysis, that if you have, basically, here's the real line, and you have a sequence that is monotonically decreasing, which means that uh, if you start here with the x1 term, the next term is less than or equal to this term. So it could be on top of it, it would be shoddy to draw it. It would, well, yeah, it wouldn't look, the picture wouldn't look as good if I drew x2 on top of x1, but x2 could have been on top of x1. So basically, I have some sequence x, which is x1, x2, x3, x4, etc. So it goes on and on, and it's a sequence of real numbers, and they are, it's monotonically decreasing. So the next term, if I take x n plus 1, so if I go to the next term, it's going to be less than or equal to x n. So uh, basically x4 is either going to be on top of x3 or it's going to be to the left of it. It cannot be to the right of it. It cannot be greater than it. And then x5 can only be to the left or on top of x4. So it cannot be to the right of it again. So it just continues going on. Now, um, some of these, uh, you can be monotonically uh, decreasing and still divergent because obviously you can you could just go on and on uh, and subtract one each time let's say uh, so x7 take away one is x8 x9 is x8 take away one etc and that doesn't converge to something it's just going off to negative infinity isn't it uh, however if the sequence is bounded so if we um, if there is some let's say uh, some um, a little m, which is, so if there's a lower bound for the sequence, so if there is, if there exists a little m, which is less than or equal to all the terms of the sequence, so whatever term of the sequence you pick, any little n you pick in the natural numbers, uh, then the little xn is greater than or equal to this m, i.e. there's a lower bound for the sequence. If that occurs, obviously there's going to be an upper bound, because x1 is just the upper bound, because x1 is going to be greater than or equal to all of the other terms of the sequence, because it's monotonic decreasing. So we can use x1 as our big M. So the sequence is certainly going to be uh, bounded above if it's monotonically decreasing. However, it's not assured that it's going, to be uh, it's going to be bounded below. But if it is bounded below, then the theorem states that uh, the sequence x converges to a limit, basically. To a limit. So the conditions are that the sequence should be monotonically decreasing. And this also works for monotonically increasing, but for our purposes, we're going to use monotonically decreasing uh, in our proof of the boltzano weierstrass theorem. So monotonically decreasing, and uh, what's the other thing? Ah, bounded below. So uh, I could just put bounded, because of course it is bounded above. Uh, but in, uh, maybe to stress the point that uh, what's important is that it's bounded below, I will put bounded below there. So those are the two conditions. And if, that, uh, if those two conditions there hold, uh, then the sequence will converge to a limit in the real numbers. So how do I prove this, basically? Well, if the sequence is bounded below, then if I take the set which contains all terms of the sequence, so if I put all the terms of the sequence into a set, so here are all the terms of the sequence, x1, x2, x3, etc, and I put all of them into this great big set, and uh, that set basically is now going to be bounded, it's going to be bounded above and it's going to be bounded below, bounded above by this number x1, which is uh, greater than or equal to all of the other numbers in this set, and bounded below by this little m, which I've said because the sequence is bounded, uh, exists, so no term, no, sorry, no element of this set is going to be less than, um, uh, less than that big m, that little m rather, sorry. So this set is bounded, bounded set. So now we use the least upper bound property of the real line, uh, but in reverse. Instead of the least upper bound, we use the greatest lower bound. Uh, but the, uh, the existence of a least upper bound implies the existence of a great, uh, greatest uh, lower bound as well, because you can just sort of uh, flip, um, the, you can just take the negative of the set and uh, use the fact that the least upper bound uh, 
property holds uh, to get that the greater uh, band property also holds. So basically, in the real line, the real line is, is very, very special. It has this property that if a set is bounded, uh, then it will necessarily have a, um, so if it's bounded above and it's bounded below, uh, well actually it's, we'll do it individually, if it's bounded above it will have a least upper bound and if it's bounded below it will have a greatest lower bound. And what that means is the concept of a greatest lower bound is uh, little m is a lower bound. So little, uh, being a lower bound, so I'll firstly define what a lower bound is. Being a lower bound for a set, so let's call this set S, so being a lower bound for the set means that uh, if little m is a lower bound for the set, it means that little m is less than or equal to all of the terms of this sequence. So I'll put uh, xi, where i is an element of the natural number. So all the elements of this set, I should have said, rather than sequence. So if you are a lower bound for a set, it means basically, so if I draw a picture, let's say the set is this interval here, which obviously this set isn't because it's countable, and this set, that the interval certainly isn't. If I take a number like, in fact, let's make it more concrete, let's make this the interval 0 to 3. If I take a number like negative 1, negative 1 is a lower bound for this set of real numbers here. The reason being that if you take any real number in this interval, 0 to 3, it is going to be greater than or equal to negative 1. So negative 1 is going to be less than or equal to absolutely every single term in this sequence. Uh, sorry, in this set. In this set. Uh, however, I want to stress another thing. Zero is also a lower bound for the set. Even though zero is in the set itself, zero satisfies the property that it is less than or equal to absolutely every term in this, uh, sorry, absolutely every element in this interval. If even zero, because if you put zero in here, obviously zero is equal to zero, so it still satisfies it because you've got the less than or equal to symbol there. So absolutely every term, every element of this set, of this interval, is greater than or equal to zero, so zero is a lower bound. Okay, uh, the concept of being the greatest lower bound, hopefully it should be obvious that zero is going to be the greatest lower bound here, that i.e. that if you go any further up, if you go, go to any higher number, it's no longer going to be a lower bound, and that is exactly what it means to be the greatest lower bound. So if you have, uh, let's call it, what should I call it, um, let's call it I, um, or should we call it G for greatest lower bound, uh, if G is the greatest lower bound for a set S, then it means that for all uh, little s is an element of the set big S. So for all little s is an element of the set big S, that g firstly is a lower bound, so g is less than or equal to all the elements of the set. So it is a lower bound, so uh, this greatest lower bound means you are a lower bound, but also that if you take any number, so and for all that say um, epsilon greater than zero, g plus epsilon, so if you take a tiny little number greater than g, so here's g, here's our, let's put our set s, let's imagine our set s is here, uh, oh dear, you need it like that, our set s is here, so maybe the open interval, if you take any number g plus epsilon, it is no longer going to be in a, a, a lower bound, g plus epsilon is not a lower bound not a lower bound. And what does it mean to not be a lower bound? It means that there must exist some element of this set, big S, which is uh, which is strictly less than g plus epsilon, i.e. Uh, g plus epsilon doesn't satisfy the condition of being a lower bound because there is an element of the set uh, which was actually less than it, so it wasn't greater than or equal to that uh, number. So uh, for all uh, epsilon greater than zero, g plus epsilon, um, sorry, there exists some little s which is an element of big S such that little s is less than g plus epsilon. So let me show you why zero in this example up here satisfies the condition for being a um, a uh, greater slur bound because if you take any epsilon greater than zero then if I draw another picture because that one's a bit messy. So we've got this interval zero to three and if you now take any number as uh, 
uh, 0 plus epsilon, which obviously is just epsilon. So if you take any g plus epsilon, g in this case is 0, so we've got any epsilon uh, above here, I need to be able to show you that th that epsilon is not a lower bound for this. And the meaning of not being a lower bound is to say that not all the elements of this set are less than or equal to you. Uh, so I need to be able to find an element of the set which is actually strict, sorry, um, the meaning of being a lower bound is that all the elements of this set are strictly greater than or equal to you. Uh, so, uh, the, if, if it's not a lower bound, it means that there must be some element of the set which is strictly less than it. And obviously, we could just pick zero, because zero is an element of the set here. So zero is less than epsilon, zero is less than epsilon, and zero is an element of the set. So, uh, epsilon cannot be uh, a lower bound. Uh, for uh, this set, because here is a number, here is an element of the set which is strictly less than it, so it's not a lower bound, basically. Uh, so that's the concept of a greatest lower bound. Okay, and basically we're going to use this uh, concept to uh, prove uh, the theorem that we want to prove, i.e. that uh, this sequence, this monotonically decreasing sequence, has a limit, because if, because now what we know is that this uh, is that this set, which we call Big S, which was the set, all the set containing all the terms of the sequence, so x1, x2, x3, etc., and you put them all into a set together. This set is bounded below. It's bounded below by that little m because we assumed that the sequence was bounded below. So all the terms of this sequence are less than or equal to this little m. So they were all up here. So let's say x1, x2 x3, and remember it was monotonically decreasing like that, uh, but it never got smaller than this uh, little m basically. So, because it's bounded below, now that you, we use this property of the real numbers to say that there must exist a greatest lower bound, which is often, uh, instead of saying greatest lower bound, we often call that the infinum, the infinum of this set, x1, x2, x3. This exists basically, so let's call that number i. Now, what I want to show you is that this monotonically decreasing sequence converges to the infinum uh, of this set containing all the terms of the sequence. So basically, if I put i here, what happens is that the terms of this sequence get arbitrarily close to it and converge up to it like that. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the infinum of this set, basically. Uh, so by definition, what's going to happen is that this is going to converge. So I'm going to show you that now. Okay, so what we want to now prove is that the sequence x, which is equal to little x1, little x2, little x3, all the way on, uh, converges, the limit of this sequence, the limit as n approaches infinity of this sequence xn, is going to be this infinum, where the i is defined to be the infinum of the set containing all the terms of this sequence, like so. Okay, so that's what we want to prove now. So to prove that the limit of this sequence is equal to that, uh, what we need to show is that, uh, well, we need to show the definition of uh, convergence. And the definition of convergence is that for all epsilon greater than zero, so if I draw a picture, here is our uh, limit i, our supposed limit. If it is a limit, then for all epsilon greater than zero, I should be able to draw you an epsilon ball around that around that um, limit i, which corresponds to the interval i minus epsilon to i plus epsilon, and I should be able to find you a point in the sequence, some x big n, after which uh, all of the terms, for, well, for that term and all of the terms after it, they are within this epsilon ball, and you should be able to do that for all epsilon. So for all epsilon, there should exist some big n, which is an element of the natural numbers, such that if little n is greater than or equal to big N, it implies that um, the dist the more and the absolute value of x n minus i is less than epsilon, which is exactly the same statement that the terms of the sequence are within this open wall. Because if their absolute value difference between this uh, value i is less than epsilon, then they are within that interval, basically. Uh, so this just says there exists some point, uh, the, there exists some big M, which is an element of the natural numbers, i.e. there exists some term in the sequence. So if we draw the sequence out, x1, x2, x3, you go up to some x big N, you find that. And obviously big M will depend on what your original choice of epsilon was. Uh, then for that term and all the terms after it, so if you pick a little m which is greater than or equal to big N, so uh, x n plus 1 maybe, uh, all of those terms after it are going to be within uh, that open ball.
Okay, or within that interval, if you prefer to say it like that. Okay, so how are we going to prove that that is true? That uh, for all eps for an arbitrary epsilon, you can do this. So the way that we would do that is we'd say, okay, let epsilon be greater than zero. So give me an arbitrary epsilon. I need to find you. I need to show you that for any arbitrary epsilon, I can find you a point in this sequence after which, uh, for that point and after it, all of the terms of the sequence are within that epsilon ball. So let epsilon be greater than zero, and let epsilon be arbitrary, uh, and uh, I need to show, so I'm required to prove that there exists some big N, which is an element of the natural numbers, such that uh, for all little n is greater than or equal to big N, uh, xn is an element of this interval, i minus epsilon to i plus epsilon. Right, well, uh, we now use the definition of i as the infinum of this set. Because i is the infinum of this set, so we have i here, and if I take some epsilon uh, epsilon interval around it, so i minus epsilon to i plus epsilon, because it is, um, because it is the, um, the least upper bound, basically, I must be able to find you an element of this set which is within that epsilon ball. So there must exist some element of this set, let's call it x, uh, what should I call it, xi, let's say. There must exist some point in this set which is within that epsilon ball, basically. The proof is that if there wasn't, then the i would not be the infinum because um, I could take any point bigger than i in this epsilon ball and that would still be a lower bound. So it would not be the infinum because if there were no points of this set within this interval, well, since i is a lower bound uh, for this set, uh, then all of the points must be over here, i.e. It must be beyond this interval. Uh, so all of the terms of, the, of this set must be over here which is a contradiction because then I could pick any point uh, in this uh, to the well to the uh, right of this um, of this I but still within this epsilon neighborhood uh, and I could use that as the uh, least of a bound instead well I could do that would be a lower bound and therefore it would contradict this being the least of a bound so if there weren't a point uh, in this set within this epsilon neighborhood then it would contradict I being the least of a bound okay uh, so I found some XI uh, in this set which is within that open ball. Okay, uh, my claim is let that i, we'll, we'll denote that i big N. So we'll use that as our big N basically. And all terms in the sequence after that must be less than it because um, it's a monotonically decreasing sequence. So if I now denote this i as big N, so I've relabeled it basically, I've just renamed it, called it X big N rather than X i. Um, because I'm now going to use that as my x big N. All the terms of the sequence, because the sequence x, in which is equal to x1, x2, x3, all the way up to xn and beyond, xn plus 1, xn plus 2, etc. Because the sequence is monotonically decreasing, all the terms of the sequence must be after this term here. So they must be, uh, they must be, um, they must be lower than it. So here, let's say this one here is x big n plus 1, and etc. you go on. However, they must also be greater than or equal to i, so they cannot go beyond i, uh, because i is the infinum, it's a lower bound. So all of the terms of this sequence are greater than or equal to i. So basically it says that all of the remaining terms of the sequence after x big n are within that little interval there, and that little interval is certainly contained within this epsilon ball. So what I've proven to you is you give me any epsilon ball, I can find you a point in the sequence uh, for which that point is within this epsilon ball and all of the terms after it in the sequence are also within the epsilon ball and that works because the sequence is monotonically decreasing and because the sequence is bounded below meaning that there is this least upper bound basically. Uh, this i. So basically, any monotonically decreasing sequence, uh, x1, x2, x3, etc., uh, which is bounded below, i.e. there is some number uh, that is less than or equal to all the terms of the sequence, will have a least upper bound, uh, so put all the, all the terms of the sequence in a set and find its infinum, which you can do because of the properties of the real numbers, um, 
and basically the sequence will converge down to that infinum. Okay, so that's all for this video. In the next video, what we'll do is discuss limb sups, and then we'll use uh, limb sups to uh, prove the Bolzano-Weierstrass theorem.